A while ago, Greg said, you know, turn off your iPhones because it interferes, so I'm, I turn mine off. It just helps out. <laughs> Take your picture now. <laughs> Okay. I, I like to lead in seven line prayer and then I like to, and each time maybe one person do the whole most of the prayers but then alternate seven line you know give you all a chance mm -hmm. 
Morgen, Yogi, Yom Chansam, Hema Gesa Dangola, Yatsen Yogi no Brudne, Hema June Shesudra, Kordu Kandra Mambu Keki Jesu da Kruki Chin Chilo Chilsepsu So Guru Pama Siddhi Mangan Yogi Nam Jansam Pama Gesa Danko Yatsen Chogi no Krudne, Hema June Shesudra, Kordu Kandrama Bhutva, Keki Jesudha Krudhi, Jinji Lokshu Setsu Teacher, photo destroyer, thus gone. Perfect, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good qualities, good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, photo destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, out of knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, Thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, 
through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique supreme ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three, ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all seeing and thereby subduing the enemies of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of aging, sickness and death. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings, of your boundless compassion, of your blessings. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Khan Yami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Raja Guriha together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Valokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Valokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Valokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Sharadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates 
also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no I element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There's no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, tayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate buddhi soha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Aryavada Kateshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Mahasattva Aryavalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised with that spoken by the Bhagavan. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. Thank you, Lama. Thank you. Wonderful. Good to see. Well, in uh, video land, people in person, it's wonderful. <clears throat> We're going to continue to talk about the 12 links of dependent origination. 
Uh, and uh, the way I like to teach uh, is to uh, always uh, look at the summit first. If you're climbing a mountain, you wanna know like where the summit is. So uh, you want to at least flash on uh, the uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen view, um, looking at that which uh, is the realization of nature of mind, nature of self, nature of phenomena. <clears throat> So uh, it's important to start with view. Uh, the Eightfold Path starts with view, right? So <clears throat> even if we haven't attained the view or stabilized the view, uh, we have to glance up and uh, you know see uh, the summit, right? See the goal. <clears throat> After that, yes, we have to uh, watch our feet on the path so we don't uh, fall into the crevasse. <laughs> like that <laughs> and uh, stay on the trail. But uh, uh, every once in a while we have to glance up, right? Or we have to remember because usually when we're halfway up the mountain, uh, we're tired and there may be uh, clouds halfway up the mountain. So uh, we have to remember, oh, okay, the view is still there, the summit's still there. Um, and also the path is still there like that. <clears throat> The uh, 12 links uh, is a description of how uh, things appear and how samsara appears, how it is created like that. <clears throat> uh, you know, how things appear on sometimes what we call the relative level. Uh, in this case, it's good to remind people of uh, some of their studies that people have been reading with the uh, Buddha Dharma study program that uh, in the Yogacara Chitmachan style, there are um, like three, um, three realities we talk about, right? We talk about uh, absolute truth. Um, and then we talk about delusion. And then we talk about uh, the interdependent, dependent reality uh, in the middle. Did I get that right? Anybody, you better correct me now. <laughs> uh, and the uh, Madhyamaka style, uh, generally there's just ultimate and conventional, right? Just ultimate and relative. <clears throat> um, but uh, sometimes it's useful also to look at things from this Yogacara perspective because uh, it talks about uh, things that are absolutely false. Um, <clears throat> but then it also talks about how things uh, appear correctly relatively. So the Buddha's uh, 12 links is an attempt to talk about how things uh, appear relatively, but still uh, uh, in a way that we can understand and help us deliberate. So not just delusional side, um, but uh, true, but not ultimately true like that. The Buddhist point was to try to describe experience. So he's giving us a description of uh, actual experience of how samsara, how frustration, discouragement, depression, and suffering uh, come about and what they're like. So he has this uh, 12 link, 12 um, aspects that he focused on. We need to first relate with people with their suffering in their actual situation, usually before we start uh, proclaiming uh, absolute truth, don't we? So when we're suffering, we're having problems of any kind, um, usually it doesn't help to say, oh, uh, the nature of things is open and luminous, so don't worry. <laughs> Or it's all empty, so don't worry. Um, uh, it can help to say that to the right person at the right time, but generally um, we want to hear about how a situation came to be, what the causes and conditions were to lead to our relative situation of suffering, and how to untangle those or uh, you know, start new causes and conditions that 
uh, relieve the suffering. <clears throat> so that's uh, what we're doing with this 12 links system like that. <clears throat> we're talking about feeling today. And um, this is a good one to talk about because uh, most of the time uh, in California uh, and uh, when I uh, talk to people uh, in my therapy profession, uh, we're talking about uh, feelings, right? Or at least you use that word. I feel this, I feel that. Um, <clears throat> uh, therapists uh, are generally trained to say, no, that's, that's, uh, that's not a feeling, that's a thought. <laughs> or um, sometimes therapists will say, ah, uh -huh, how do you feel about that? <laughs> so uh, it is really important because uh, our feelings, whether they're thoughts or a mixture of thoughts and emotions, or they are emotions, or a mixture of thoughts, sensations, and emotions are uh, generally uh, why we're going to uh, want to relieve the suffering, right? Something doesn't feel good. And the uh, uh, Buddhist idea, when we're talking about feelings uh, of the link, um, it's very, it's reduced to very um, simple but profound uh, schema. Uh, feelings are our evaluation uh, after contact of a sensation or a thought or perception or whatever. And these evaluations take the form of it feels good, it feels bad, or I don't care, indifferent. So things, we, sometimes they're translated as pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, or kind of feels good, bad, and indifferent. And uh, that is the basis of uh, the next link, where generally we want to increase the good feelings, the pleasant feelings, and we want to reduce or eliminate the unpleasant feelings like that or painful. So it's, you know, feelings that are evaluations that are pleasant and feel good and we want to see more of those and thoughts and emotions and sensations uh, after our contact with uh, the world or our inner world even that we want to discontinue. And then there's a whole bunch of things that we're uh, kind of clueless about or indifferent about. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the 12 link scheme, um, the Buddha points out that it's these feelings, uh, these evaluations that have both an emotional and cognitive uh, aspect that give rise to craving and aversion. <clears throat> Usually um, in foundational Buddhism, sometimes we call it Hinayana Buddhism, the emphasis is put on uh, eliminating the craving, isn't it? So, uh, you know, just uh, let go or notice that the craving um, doesn't really feel good, something like that. Generally in, in Mahayana and Vajrayana, we're gonna put the emphasis on ignorance that uh, we are uh, the problem isn't with uh, the feeling as much as making a wrong judgment or seeing it, uh, the feeling about the situation as being incorrect or the situation is incorrect. But in any case, uh, the feeling aspect, the evaluation and felt sense uh, that's both cognitive and emotional, uh, I think is, is really important. So um, even though I make Fun of Californians that are always talking about feelings, because uh, we didn't do that in New York. That's a joke. We don't talk about feelings in New York, um, where I grew up. Uh, also, a joke on my family, because uh, and my family growing up, um, we just had one feeling that was called fine. <laughs> How are you feeling? Fine, you know, like no matter what. You know, it's like I remember my mom saying to me, just you know, like. When an adult sticks up a hand, you know, you shake their hands and they, they say, how are you 
how are you doing? And you just go, fine, thank you. Aww. That's it, you know? <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of value in that. I mean, I, I do value <laughs> nice decorum and manners. And the minute we meet someone, uh, it's usually not cool to tell them a whole story. But uh, later on, of course, as some of us know, that inability to articulate uh, our feelings and emotions and our thoughts ends up being a big problem. <laughs> <clears throat> so most of the time, traditional teachers and descriptions uh, don't go into feeling that much. They just mention that, okay, we have pleasant, unpleasant, and uh, indifferent or neutral or good and bad. But um, I feel that uh, the evaluation process, which is automatic, uh, doesn't have to be automatic. So that's where the sense of wisdom comes in, the sense of insight, the sense of discernment comes in sense of slowing down and seeing the bigger picture and Shantan Vipassana, let alone Mahamudra and Dzogchen comes in, like we could go, oh, that was really pleasant. Do I want to continue that? Do I want to repeat that? Does that pleasant lead to liberation and bliss? Or does that pleasant lead to um, half a pound gained after eating just a little bit of Ben and Jerry's, right? So uh, can we evaluate our feelings or is it automatic? I, I'd like uh, to have some kind of discussion about that um, during this time. In samsara, uh, when we're screwed up, uh, it feels automatic and also our evaluation, our felt sense, our experiential cognitive evaluation of our contact with uh, either our inner world or outer world seems completely fused, right? So um, that's like a uh, couples therapy when somebody says, I, I feel you're really a jerk. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and, we have to intervene and say, well, you, you, you know, we have, that's a judgment about someone, uh, which is a uh, cognitive. Uh, so is that how the judgment you want to make? But uh, also there's uh, a sense of uh, energy and affect that goes with that. And maybe they're not um, always the same. For example, you could think someone's a jerk and still love them, right? <laughs> so you could have kind of judgment or you could think they're kind of unpleasant um, much of the time. However, uh, you know, I, I still care about them and want to see them free and happy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe that educating uh, this, what's called seventh link, uh, is extremely important to bring awareness to it. <clears throat> the uh, pleasant feelings uh, and pleasant evaluation is an important part of uh, continuing the Dharma path. Uh, if we're practicing uh, our meditations, whether it's shamatha or uh, tantra or dzogchen, um, and there's, there's no sense of well-being, there's no sense of uh, pleasurable feelings, uh, there's no sense of uh, joy or encouragement, then, then there's gonna be a problem there, right? You're gonna notice that. But also, uh, if the present feelings are pursued uh, with negative consequences, we have something uh, called addiction, right? Likewise, if, uh, we're trying to always avoid unpleasant feelings, uh, then uh, we're gonna end up avoiding more and more in life, don't you think? <laughs> we may not wanna go outside. <laughs> we may not want to interact with anybody. And then finally, we may not wanna interact at all with ourselves. <clears throat> uh, a big part um, of my practice with my teacher was uh, investigating um, what we would call like a neutral feelings. 
uh, neutral contact, right? We make contact with anything and then um, uh, work into look into the inside is what is uh, our experience at that point of contact. And of course, if it is pleasurable, uh, we notice that and we can decide do I want to continue this? If it's unpleasant, we might decide I don't want to continue this or something. Um, but usually with neutral contact uh, or an initial evaluation neutrality, we skip right on by it. It's neutral, it's kind of like no big deal. Uh, and then uh, we miss an opportunity uh, for realization at that point. So uh, from uh, foundational Buddhism, from wanting to uh, escape addictive patterns, of course, we want to notice right away that continuing uh, to do pleasurable, uh, continuing pleasurable experiences with negative consequences uh, needs to be abandoned. Um, or continuing to have pleasant, unpleasant consequences also needs to be abandoned. A lot of times we forget about uh, this thing we call neutral or impartial. So in deep meditation practice, we're asked to explore um, that point of a initial contact um, uh, before uh, uh, that could be pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral um, before the craving starts, okay? So we're not, um, we're not just waiting until uh, we notice the craving uh, in foundational Buddhism and uh, letting go of the craving. We're, we're noticing uh, uh, that point of contact where the sense of involvement uh, with the uh, um, world, inner or outer, uh, becomes engaged. So uh, I'm not sure, like, uh, one of the sources that I like quoting from, it could be Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, so Chen Ponlop Rinpoche, where uh, uh, they translate uh, feeling as engagement, you know, engagement. So this contact, uh, where, <laughs> you know, but then there's engagement. So because all of you are doing uh, at least 24 minutes of shamatha every day, I'm sure your minds are slowing down. So you can notice like, oh, there's contact and then there's feeling or engagement and then uh, this craving or aversion. <clears throat> so I'd like to suggest that this seventh link um, having to do with engagement is uh, an important uh, situational patterning uh, to use uh, Dr. Goodman's phrase that um, is particularly important in the uh, uh, path, particularly in Tantra, and particularly in the higher yogas of Mahamudra, Dzogchen, and particularly the uh, neutral or indifferent. So we make contact and there's a sense of uh, something going on and then uh, we, and we engage with it and Yes, it's either going to be pleasant where we want more or unpleasant where we want less and neutral where we're passed by. But if we relate with those from a wisdom mind, then uh, that's an interesting point of liberation right there. <clears throat> so uh, it is important to ask uh, how people are feeling. Um, uh, knowing that feeling entails both a cognitive and emotional sense. Um, there was a movie a number of years ago about a young boy that uh, was a dancer in a coal mining town. Um, uh, was it Billy Elliot? Was that the name? Uh, so uh, this boy had some talent and uh, somehow he got to uh, through persistence audition before the uh, Royal Ballet um, Committee. And um, uh, 
uh, he gave a very energetic and heartfelt um, presentation. Um, and the committee members, uh, you know, asked him some generic questions, kind of uh, that uh, elicited kind of cognitive answers, right? Uh, until finally, uh, one of the um, committee members, uh, a female, maybe that was not, maybe that was coincidence, but she says, what's it feel like when you're dancing, right? So uh, maybe some people remember that movie and he said, well, it feels like electricity is running through my body, right? And uh, there was a connection there, right? So uh, of course the good news is he got into the school, right? So. Um, the ability to uh, use an articulate feeling uh, helps us uh, really connect um, with more than just contact. It helps us integrate and be totally engaged with what we're doing. So there is a, a painful, ignorant, and samsaric way of relating to feeling that increases our suffering, but there's also uh, a liberation way. So even though in Mahayana, uh, we tend to emphasize, um, you know, not being ignorant, you know, seeing the nature of things, uh, particularly in Tantra, we're going to em emphasize the experiential or feeling tone. What do you think? So maybe uh, we could have some kind of uh, discussion if that's possible. <clears throat> okay. Hi. Hi. Well, I've kind of uh, noticed that things that I think are that I'm indifferent to, if I actually bring my attention to them, I'm not indifferent to them. And so I've come to the conclusion that they're really only positive and negative, and that indifference <laughs> is just things that I haven't paid attention to. Do you think that is a valid uh, understanding, or am I deluding myself with that approach? Uh... I'm with you kind of 50%. Uh, lots of times what we think is indifferent is we haven't really investigated to see that we do have some either attraction or aversion to it. But indifference can also uh, blossom as uh, equanimity and a profound sense of spaciousness too. Like that. Uh, but so, is, is equanimity indifference though? Well, indifference would be kind of the uh, samsaric side, right? So, you know, we're, we're just not, we're not paying attention to it. We're indifferent to the sufferings of others or we're indifferent to our own problems or something. So it's transmuted, uh, you know, into equanimity like that. Because it seems like to me that uh, craving and, and uh, uh, aversion can also be transmuted into equanimity in that fashion where something that seems to be unpleasant can be viewed with equanimity. But I still find that I dig out uh, that I have a, a, a polar attraction or unattraction to things, but maybe I'm cutting the hairs too finely. Well, the good news that uh, you point out is actually a lot can be transmuted into equanimity <laughs> or we're in big trouble. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, equanimity is a, a huge, um, where we're having a sense of balance and spaciousness, uh, unbiased, you know, remake position. So, uh, you know, uh, equanimity, you know, bringing things in equanimity, uh, whatever the case, you know, is, is going to be, you know, really important. So unfortunately, um, you know, all, all the misunderstandings we could say could be brought into equanimity. You know, actually, you know, when, when we have a wisdom mind and the right motivation, of course, any experience becomes uh, cause for some sorrow or a cause for realization. But I, I like your point that sometimes the sense of a difference, uh, you know, really is a, is a kind of avoidance, right? So when we look at it uh, carefully, 
uh, then we, we see this, some aversion or some craving there. So of course, then we're going to bring that into equanimity, but sometimes exploring things that seem kind of uninteresting, um, you know, then become uh, a window for us to, So it's not indifference, but it's just a great sense of spaciousness. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hello. Uh, thanks. Lama, it's very interesting. I've been um, thinking a lot lately about feelings that I have that are recurring, almost like mm -hmm. an oversensitivity or I don't know if clinically if it applies, but sort of a trauma response. And I wonder if that's feeling or, I mean, usually as you spoke today, I thought about it a bit more, some first and then the feeling follows, but it just, it just comes fast, even though it may not feel appropriate for the situation. It may be based on a memory or something. And I wonder if that is feeling in the sense of the 12 links or if that's something else. Well, feeling as feeling has this uh, uh, energetic and emotional and cognitive uh, valuation that that's unpleasant or that's pleasant. So wherever that's occurring, because when we say the links, it, it doesn't mean you know. I mean, those are happening simultaneously all the time, like that. So oh, there's there's feeling. So. Uh, this can be feeling and trauma too, right? You know, and this automatic feeling. Most of the time, things are happening automatically. We're, we're not even conscious of uh, the process of uh, contact and uh, feeling going on. Because feelings and evaluation, feeling evaluation is such a strong part of our uh, makeup that uh, lots of times it becomes totally foreground, right? Mm -hmm. It's huge. Why it's just huge. So that's why, even though I say, okay, let's not talk about feelings anymore in California, but uh, we have to talk about that, right? Because it's huge. So particularly in Vajrayana, we're, we're willing to talk about feelings mm -hmm. and emotions. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Does it make, I'm, it seems like you want, there's something more, so. No, I'm just wondering if there are lessons from the 12 links that can help me sort of sort out or think about feelings like that or things that seem like they're just like tired, like it's a tired recurring looping process and I'm ready to, ready to evolve from it, but it still keeps showing up. Well, yeah, that's it. I mean, it, it is, it's circular and repetitive and reactive, right? So mm -hmm. uh, that's why you say samsara is like a circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's reoccurring. So it's uh, it's not linear. Mm -hmm. I mean, we always have to talk about things in linear fashion because that's language and time, but um, yeah, they, they're very strong and it just pops up and it grows there. So yeah. particularly strong and very hurtful traumatic situations where uh, the aversion and, and the grasping and, and the attempt to avoid uh, indifference is really, really strong. So, yeah. You know, so uh, it was important for the Buddha to talk about cause and effect as a way of uh, saying, this is a skillful means to deal with our experience because uh, uh, he said, uh, you know, he was having discussions in India with people that thought that things were random, right? Mm. You know, things just happen, right? And of course, many people's experience, particularly when things are difficult or this trauma, is things just complete, completely feel random, right? Completely mm. feel like just uh, split and out of control, right? And he said, well, actually, yes, that is an experience, but this is the way it actually operates. It mm. operates, you know, with causes, effects, and conditions. And there are some people that said, oh, all these different experiences have their source in the gods or God or something, right? So he said, uh, no, these things don't have their sources in outer um, 
beings causing them to be in our mind or bodies. Uh, these are not, you know, they're coming about through their own interlock causes. And third, you know, there were people that were very materialistic, right? Uh, and fatalistic. So, you know, it's like, well, that's too bad. You feel crappy and, you know, that's, there's nothing you can do about it because that's your karma. So accept that fate, right? So those three basic, you know, kind of philosophies that the Buddha was being critical of, you know, a sense of uh, randomness, a sense of permanence as in the gods, uh, and a sense of fate or, mm -hmm. you know, caste structure or something like that. So, you know, as I said earlier, it's kind of using a Paratantra idea that uh, let's, let's get your relative experience back to something that's workable, right? That we can um, work with mm -hmm. like that. It's still relative reality in the sense that if we go looking for feeling as a separate thing, as a fixated thing, you can't find it as a fixated separate thing, right? But yet um, it does have its own, uh, you know, relative existence. It just doesn't have ultimate existence. But uh, uh, Buddha's talking about interdependent origination. Uh, one, that's the way he's, he sees things uh, that are how to explain how the world appears, right? <clears throat> Uh, when we look closely, of course, we can't even find uh, relative existence, right? <laughs> but this time, when we're working with trauma, we're working with our own pain, and particularly in relationships, then, uh, you know, we, we have to work with the world of relationships and the uh, world as it appears, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I accidentally put down the wrong hand of either Marie or Susan Farrar, and I don't know if one of them want to chime in next. Or... Susan, hi. Marie. I, I don't know if it was one of them. Hey. Hi. 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 Um, I just had a comment and then a question. Um, yeah. I get a little hung up on the word indifference because when I was studying, um, and admittedly, it was Theravadan teachers, Hinayana teachers, um, that indifference was the near enemy of equanimity. And so the word um, impartial, I think, works better for me. I get a little hung up on the word indifference because that's got very negative connotations. Um, it's, I, it's, I think people are misunderstanding me about it. So we want to investigate indifference so it's transmuted into equanimity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Our, usual, our usual sense of attraction and aversion is also tainted. So, you know, we, we, and we investigate those. So we need to investigate all three responses. Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. So um, I just say there's an opportunity in this area, this link, you know, between, which is kind of a cause and effect between contact and craving, you know, to, uh, to really, uh, you know, do some liberation and do some insight. I think by the time we reach craving, it's really hard to say no. Yeah. <laughs> you oh. know, by the time we, we've really decided this is pleasurable, it's really, really, really hard to say no. And by, you know, and I wonder if a neutral feeling is even really a possible unless the mind encounters something entirely new. So like, a, you know, a six month old baby is gonna be having a lot of neutral feelings because everything is new but a 70 year old person is not going to encounter generally a lot that is new and so everything is already either positive or negative is either but neutral is very hard to come by unless there's something that is completely new is that 
you know? <laughs> yeah, so uh, of course the good news is the way things actually are is totally new every moment. <laughs> so it right. doesn't matter what age we are, you know, <laughs> or where we are in samsara, uh, it's totally fresh and spontaneous actually each moment. So, uh, you know, the, our, our Buddhist evaluation is, uh, you know, samsara and nirvana are happening simultaneously. We're caught and liberated simultaneously. So we have the repetitive patterns, but also if we know where to look, we also see that uh, each moment is also completely fresh. So that, that would be that kind of uh, neutral equanimity. But the indifference is kind of an avoidance, kind of an ignorance thing. I, I don't want to look at it. I mean, I'm not interested in it. You know, kind of I'll pass it by or go away or something. You know, you're boring. You know, people go, it's boring, right? You know, so uh, very, it's always very important to investigate when things are boring. Is but it, you're right, usually, you know, go ahead. Are they the same? Is that, is that a synonym for neutral? Uh, we can actually be neutral. There is a neutral feeling. It just, it just depends whether wisdom mind is present or not, right? It's all about, you know, whether the view is there. If the view is not there, any experience is going to become concretized and uh, sticky. And we'll, we'll make a misapprehension about reality and about ourselves. So, you know, uh, to the extent that we're in touch with our uh, view, then uh, each experience is going to feel, have a sense of freshness. But usually um, when we're on the path, um, we're having uh, uh, the experience of having a wonderful climb and we have a, um, uh, you know, the boots are too tight and we have some blisters, right? <laughs> you know, we're having these simultaneous experiences. It's not either or, uh, it's a beautiful day. And, and also there's something wrong too. But the repetitive world uh, and the liberation world are going on simultaneously. Everything's so completely free. You know, they, they just don't cancel each other out. It's just really weird, completely free and open. It's unbelievable, you know, so until you've had the experience, you won't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got like, because from a logical point of view, it doesn't seem possible. Yeah. Uh, when, we're, when we're having a particularly hard time, of course, it, it, it seems, you know, like, like it's right like this, you know, of course. So we have to validate, you know, we say that's, we have to validate that when we're working with ourselves, like um, I'm stuck right now, you know, but you don't want to forget that, uh, you know, the summit is still there, even though clouds, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, don't, don't forget. So, Elizabeth Zima, where are you? You're outside. So you'll have to come on if you want. No, my question is, Lama, is Buddhism therapy? So, uh, Anything that's true and liberating is going to be healing, right? So it's therapeutic, of course. But the process isn't quite the same, is it? Um, you know, like I'm going to just be a little bit kind of annoying. Uh, <laughs> like how how <laughs> how a we little bit? Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> How, how we experience, you know, think about therapy from the side of being a client or a patient is a little bit different than how you think of it from the side of being a professional. You know, so 
uh, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, when we say, is it different than therapy? I always have to say, is it different than, you know, how it feels like from the side of a uh, patient or how it feels from the side of, you know, uh, professional, it's, it's different. Probably has to be different. You know, when I when I examine things that could be emotional, I could talk to a therapist about, but I think about them in the way that Buddha has talked about the 12 links in this link of feeling. It's more of, okay, well, there's some mental foolery going on here. There's some... Um, acculturation that I've agreed to, and perhaps that's not what's happening. Like, you know, I live with a 93 year old, that's a fucking nightmare. But if I think about it in the way of the 12 links, let's just say, think about it in 12 links and my feeling about it, and examining my relationship to my mother, which I don't really have to do, but think about it in a way that breaks it down and examines the pieces and the acculturation and the feeling. It comes out a little bit different with a little more space. And it's not such an unhappy place or a place of super anger. It's like a place of space because I always have something else is happening here. If I examine it in an Abhidharma way, there's something else happening that's consciousness. And, and that relationship with my own consciousness and her relationship with her own consciousness is very different. There's a level of understanding that comes that's really um, not therapeutic. It's like, oh, process. It's like looking at, I don't know, cultivating how you live with your mother and how she manages to live with you. It's very different. It's a different process. It's not therapeutic. I don't see it as therapeutic. Well, I, I have a different view of therapy perhaps than you do. Um, so, you know, I, a lot of times that Western therapy and theory has stayed very much in uh, the personal world, in the humanistic personal world or you know, what we can see without doing any kind of necessarily special, uh, you know, things, but that's not always entirely true. You know, there's many therapies that investigate and use uh, dream and meditation, things like that. So, uh, you know, definitely in Buddha Dharma, there's an emphasis on the existential and the deepening of awareness that, uh, hasn't been right now the, the main focus of Western therapies, which are, um, you know, been focused more on relationships and uh, family of origin and trauma issues, right, on the personal side. But uh, real Dharma is both the personal and the transpersonal together. So I wouldn't say therapy is just personal and Dharma is existential and transpersonal. Uh, real, uh, the real Bodhisattva path is both. So I think it, you know, depends upon, uh, you know, one's Lama and one's therapist too, you know, like that. But uh, uh, Dharma has to do with relationships and the nitty gritty of life too, right? It's fairly easy to realize nature of mind um, uh, and see emptiness it's more difficult to develop practical, skillful wisdom, right? Uh, and maintain motivation. So, uh, you know, that because each situation is constantly changing. So even if someone's a Buddha, then the Buddha has to decide, okay, well, um, 
what do we do with this problem? And this person's having a problem with this person. You know, what do we do now? And this person uh, seems to be having these problems in meditation. So uh, constantly need uh, practical wisdom, not just wisdom to ultimate reality. And you, uh, you know, you need a lot of savvy with, um, you know, uh, so any liberation is, is gonna be therapeutic, right? Healing, but what we normally call therapy uh, is gonna be like talk, you know, talk therapy, but um, in California, sometimes <laughs> uh, uh, to say, you know, you go to the therapist to complain, right? So, uh, or vent, but um, uh, that's okay. You know, we all need uh, friends to vent to, right? You know, we need that from time to time, but a good therapist will, uh, you know, seek to investigate the cause, not only the cause and conditions, uh, that led to that. So we'll listen to complaints for a while, venting or, uh, you know, just, we have to do that. Um, but also will help us to get to uh, cause and conditions and also therapists that, uh, uh, you know, have looked deeper into the nature of reality and mind can draw us to that also. You know, there's not, there's not a, a fence around on uh, Buddha Dharma, we don't put a fence around us, right? Like that. So, you know, like there are therapists that are, uh, you know, doing Dharma practice too, that of course are able to do both uh, perspectives. Actually, I have some in the Sangha. <laughs> we have one listening right now, <laughs> wearing white t shirt, you know, so yeah. Good question though, you know, it's like that. And then uh, Annette here had a question too. Yeah. I just wanted to ask Lamala, um, can one argue that by the time we get to the level of engagement that um, we're either working from the two, uh, you know, attraction or aversion, that neutrality goes by the wayside because our observations and feelings are going to give us a judgment. And because of our overlay, um, I, was just th I was just thinking it's gonna be one or the other because we've added our stuff to it. Questions? It's nice to have a movable mic here. Um, Actually, the, the Buddha taught and successive teachers, and I believe this too, is that, yeah, the contact uh, involves then a sense of engagement and the indifference is part of the engagement. So, you know, whether you call it indifference or kind of neutral, it's, it's part of the engagement process. So there isn't just, uh, aversion or, uh, or pleasure or pain, you know, pleasurable or unpleasant, the, those, those three are operating. How do we recognize the neutrality at that point? Yeah, it's harder to recognize that level of indifference because indifference means we're, we're not really paying attention to it. Usually the forces of unpleasant or pleasant are really much more powerful. So we're, we're not, it's, it's a little harder to notice, but uh, you know, we, it, there's a lot of uh, value to draw attention to it for sure. Usually we need other people to draw attention to it. Um, you know, usually it's other people that we're in relationship with. They just go like, you know, I don't feel your, listening to anything I'm saying or I'm feeling disconnected from you or you're feeling disconnected, right? So there's contact, but it's kind of, um, it's lukewarm, right? It's like that. So, um, <laughs> Drunk Rinpoche used to say, just don't have lukewarm avaduti, you know? Don't have your central channel be lukewarm, right? That's not acceptable. 
So don't think that uh, real equanimity or spaciousness is your kind of like, maybe whatever, you know, um, you know, whatever, you know. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so, it, but it's easy to kind of believe that indifference, as Susan pointed out, you know, can uh, easily, you know, seem like it's your equanimity or this some sense of spaciousness, but it's, it's kind of a dulling experience like that. So uh, those of us that in the past may have enjoyed um, taking medications or drugs that numbed us out, it would be like that. You know, you're pursuing the numbness feeling, so to speak, like that. You just want to be gone. So you don't, you're not chasing pleasure anymore. And you're not just trying to, you know, you're just trying to be in that numb place. <clears throat> But it's, it's harder to recognize because uh, it has a natural avoidance to it. So that's um, that engagement. Yeah. So you know, it's connected with a sense of uh, hatred or aversion, grasping and ignorance, those three. I think the Buddha liked a lot of threes, like fives, but he liked a lot of threes too. Like that. It, it's hard to explore. Uh, on that level to be sure, but because uh, usually we're thinking, I just got to get rid of my aversions and, and get rid of, um, stop, you know, my cravings for pleasurable things. But um, as we progress more, uh, the subtle things uh, become more difficult, right? So in shamatha, uh, you know, we talk about a subtle laxity, right? So the, we're not, there are not a lot of thoughts. Um, we seem to be paying attention to what we want to pay attention with. Somebody asks, what are we paying attention with? We could say, oh, I'm paying attention to my breath. And, or I can describe uh, the Buddha or deity I'm paying attention to. But there's kind of a film over it. It doesn't really sparkle. It's kind of flat. It's not three-dimensional. You know, it's just, uh, it's got a little film over it like that. So it's very subtle, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, Charlotte, hi. Somewhere, Charlotte, somewhere. I had to unmute. <laughs> well, you're here now. Um, do I have an echo there? Not yet. Okay. Um, when I approach some something, you know, that uh, I've encountered, I feel like I approach it with an open mind. I don't have an opinion yet. Uh, is that neutrality or are we talking something else? Uh, when we're talking about, you know, dependent origination, the links here, we're, we're talking about kind of a, a necessary condition of um, ordinary experience. So it, it's gonna happen that, uh, you know, whether you're just, whatever you're doing, each experience, you're going to have a very quick uh, evaluation experience, either pleasant, unpleasant, or kind of neutral. So, uh, of course, we want to go in with an open mind in general, you know, an open view, like, but, uh, you know, until uh, Buddhahood, there's, there's going to be some kind of little piece where um, uh, we're going to have these preferences, right? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, traditionally, kind of. <laughs> so, don't, don't, you know, one of my teachers used to say, "Don't, don't, don't uh, tell anybody you've uh, achieved one taste, or don't tell me you achieved one taste, then I'll put." dog shit over here and ice cream over here and see which one you want to eat. 
<laughs> <laughs> so it's good, you know, so we can have, like I said, things happening simultaneously. We can say, I'm on the path of, uh, you know, very open view, uh, uh, but I'm also knowing that I'm having these uh, repetitive patterns going on at the same time. Okay, thank you, Lamala. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, I had a question. You had just said that uh, as you do shamatha and become more aware of indifference or the neutrality of things, that there becomes a film. It is a right, but should we encourage more sparkle or should we encourage the film? <laughs> I would, you know, so uh, good question. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we're not necessarily going to uh, manifest, you know, we don't think of, uh, we don't have to add sparkle. Actually, the sparkle is there in our, you know, actual experience, but, um, you know, should most, we, huh? Should we look for it? Uh, sometimes it takes active looking. Sometimes it takes, you know, dropping uh, our, you know, our, you know, that, you know, kind of dropping that link, so to speak. So uh, I like walking around um, McKinley Park and I try not to see it, just see the trees as, you know, trees you know i try to just say like e each tree is like its own kind of tree just really see you know like that um because it's it's easy just to kind of lapse into kind of this indifferent laxity um but uh you know sometimes we have to um fake it till we make it so sometimes we do maybe have to like add a little fairy dust <laughs> you know, it's like do our experience and you know so that's kind of what we're doing um uh here temple is very bright so vajrayana is very bright so uh, we recognize that uh in samsara things are actually usually uh kind of dulled out you know we're just running around being orcs so you know it, it's okay to sprinkle some fairy dust you know <laughs> that's good yeah so uh i don't know if i see everybody on the screen is that everybody or are there are people that i don't see yet just, yeah so <clears throat> uh, it's important i think to still for me to uh realize that uh you know, what we conventionally call samsara, feeling trapped and nirvana, what we could call being liberated is uh, occurring simultaneously. So, uh, and that they uh, both emerge from a common source. Uh, I think this is a particular strength of, uh, you know, uh, taking a Dzogchen view or perspective because the tendency is to make it very either or like you're just going to jump one track to go to another track. But as some of you who come to Darshan should know, I say that we need the two truths and these two uh, rails to make uh, the train track. So your uh, life force, your bodhicitta, both relative and absolute can run on it, right? So we, we don't reject uh, samsara and we don't crave after nirvana, right? I know it's called the middle way. Or I would say from Dzogchen point of view, Maha Majumaka, right? <laughs> like that. Okay, so so um, some of you I'll see, uh, hopefully quite a few people, uh, you know, for uh, my birthday. Until then, let's do closing prayers. Thank you.
Yeah. Due to these, due to the merit of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, bodhicitta, that has not arisen, arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi, Tenzinjato. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions for the fortunate migrators, Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangratpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Lama. <laughs> miss you uh, let's talk soon everybody Thank you, Lama. yeah all right morris <laughs> thank you lama yeah you're welcome thank you lama thank you lama <laughs> thank you lama <laughs> yeah thanks for sharing <laughs> i like waving it's fun yeah it's good hello and squim hi and squim yeah. Oh, like that. who's in Squim? Yeah, someone's in Squim. We have people all over Pennsylvania, wow. Northwest, I love <laughs> yeah, Southwest, Las Vegas area, yep. the desert, the woods, the ocean. Everybody's there. Cleveland's the best. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Cleveland, <don't you>? that's <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Cleveland has a wonderful art museum. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I've heard. I've heard we we've, we've yet to make it there, but it is on our list and it's free, but that, that's the greatest thing. Oh yeah. yeah. So people can, you know, text me and say hello. I like to hear from people. All right. Ciao. See you. <laughs>